material. Uh, so um, this is an engagement that um, uh, I would love to have in person because it lends itself to in-person facilitation, uh, rich interaction around blackboards and, um, and even uh, students um, coming up and, and annotating emerging diagrams. Um, but the hand were dealt um, and the need to push forward with the schedule uh, requires it to be held uh, remotely. Uh, that does have uh, some benefits and we'll, we'll, we'll um, be able to take advantage of, of some economies because of that. Um, but I first want to situate us. I, I asked you to uh, review a video and uh, maybe someone amongst us could remind the rest here uh, speaking up or in the chat. What was um, what was the focus of that video that I asked you to watch for this session? Anyone? Yeah, causal loop diagrams. That's right. Qualitative model mapping. I love it. Um, uh, that's right. Uh, variously, um, modelers refer to these as models or model maps, um, uh, reserving the term model for a fully um, quantitative model, um, quantitative enough to be simulated, precise enough. That doesn't mean accurate, but precise, unambiguous enough to be simulated. Um, many others view them as a type of model, just not a simulation model. What anyone want to say? Why why do we build up these kind of causal loop diagrams? These these representations of a situation that are not yet fully ambigu unambiguous enough to be simulated. Um, can anyone share? some benefits for creating a an artifact a kind of representation like that to depict uh to depict the situation yeah it's a good communication tool i like it that's right it's a good communication tool it takes it takes understanding best guesses of an inter interpretation of the situation out of our head and puts it um uh puts it in front of others yeah it can communicate what's happening in the model communication wise. So it can you know, communicate the essence or the many of the, the heart of what's going on um, in a model, uh, in a simulation model in a transparent fashion. Focus on feedback effects. I love it, Akash, because that's what I was about to um, emphasize because really cost loop diagrams as abstractions, they're, they're taking their one or two steps removed from all the details in model formulation. Um, but they capture certain features of a situation. And Akash shared with us feedbacks. They capture feedbacks. And in fact, that's what gives causal loop diagrams its name. It's, a, it's capturing feedback effects. Anyone remember? When it comes to fully quantitative types of system dynamics diagrams like stock and flow, um, what does that capture beyond feedbacks? There's actually a key element of, of sort of system dynamics thinking or perspective beyond feedback that we capture with a stock and flow diagram. Anyone? What's that additional point? Rates of change? Yes, I like that very much. Rates of change. But there's something even more basic than that. It's rates of change with respect to what? I'll give you a hint. It begins with an A. And the next two letters are C, C, U, M. Uh, accumulations. Yeah, it's accumulations. It's accumulations at some sort. It's these, these kind of, um, we think of stocks as capturing this amount of an accumulation of stuff. And there's rates of change of that over time that are continuous. It rises and it falls. But ultimately, we have 
some accumulation in place um, that you know can can then trend upwards or trend downward, but it has state. It has there's a current situation that it captures and it can move up and down. It's not that each successive instant is totally random. No, no, no. There's a inertia to it. There's a continuity to it. There's a you know a, a, a point a, a current situation that it has and it evolves from that over time. And and the evolution of those stocks, what is that driven by? That's driven by what? Begins with F. Yes, flows, flows. I love it. I love it. I love it. Okay, we're getting a great set of answers. That's right. It's driven by flows. Now that is this is not featured in causal loop diagrams. So if we if we think about situating ourselves in the modeling process more generally, and then about the kind of formalisms at these parts, you know, we're we're way down here. Um at these early stages, we're deciding what's in the model and then we're mapping it out. You could say qualitatively and you wouldn't be wrong. I prefer to say semi-qualitatively or semi-quantitatively. Why do I why do I say that? Why do I say it's it's not purely narrative, qualitative, not purely just a kind of amorphous description? What do we have? That, that takes us beyond qualitative. Um, yeah, we have polarity. We have polarity, and that's key, what FISA said. It's not just that we say factor A influences factor B with a link from A to B, but we actually indicate polarity. We say, what? well, someone could tell me, but what do we say when we're dealing with a with a, a, a causal loop diagram. What do we say when we're dealing with, um, uh, ah, okay, I'm in the wrong slides for that. What do we say when we're dealing with one of these? Um, what, what does a link from A to B mean? Say from smoking to nicotine dependence. What does that plus mean? Anyone? Okay, positive, yeah. Okay, positive reinforcement. Well, I'm getting warm, but no, there's something. Ah, uh, 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 okay, okay, we're we're getting warm. We're getting warm. What direction? One variable. Ceteris paribus. Okay, let's let's sharpen this. Because by sharpening it now, you can sharpen your answer on the next pop quiz in the final exam. Mm. Okay. So uh, Akash has, has hit hit the nail, helping to build on others' responses to sharpen it. So, so if there's an arrow from A to B, let's say some smoking to nicotine dependence that's associated with a plus, what is that saying? Um, if if which increases, if we posit an increase by by which. If we so a link from smoking to nicotine dependence says if we imagine a, a change in what in the value of smoking, yeah, the source. There's a link from A to B. If we imagine a change in A, we ask, how does it do what? How in what direction does it change what? The come on, you could do better than that. Yeah, nicotine, but yeah, so so if we have a change in the source of this link, if we increase that, suppose, um, how does it change the value of the target of that link? Right? And can you use different words for the, the source or the the, the uh, origin of the link or whatever, but if we increase smoking, can, how does it change the value of nicotine dependence? And, and there's a huge qualifier here. Does it increase it or decrease it? What? Okay, well. 
<laughs> yeah, I would say map.c as an error, as a syntax error. Um, just don't show it to everyone else, okay? Um, uh, it No, it doesn't increase the rate of change necessarily. It increases it, but what? Relative to what? Rather interesting, that error map.c. I'm going to go back and check what that was about. Um, mm, mm, um, um, uh, TAs, maybe you can make note of that uh, comment. Um, uh, so, so it increases it relative to the value it otherwise would have had. And there's something else I'll add in a moment, but otherwise would have had. That doesn't mean if you increase smoke, if, if there's a plus, it doesn't mean if you increase smoking, nicotine dependence goes up over time necessarily. Don't make that mistake. Now we're on the final exam. We're on the pop quiz for that one. Doesn't mean it goes up over time necessarily. Doesn't mean it increases the rate of it. No, 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 no. It means it increases the value of the target compared to the value it otherwise would have had had we not increased the tar the, the source. So if smoking goes up, does it tend to increase nicotine dependence compared to what it would have been if smoking did not go up? Or does it decrease it compared to what it would have been had smoking not goes up? Okay, it changes it compared to what it would have been if we had not increased that source variable. That's what we're comparing. We're comparing it of how it changed relative if we hadn't fussed with smoking, if we hadn't increased smoking, how would nicotine dependence change? Um, I saw a, a question. I saw a hand. Um, Tusif uh, had a question. Yes, Tusif. Yeah, can I, so it would be, so we could summarize this change by saying if all the other variables are same at a given time, yes. increasing, smoke, increasing smoking will increase the nicotine dependencies. Um, can, but no, don't say it that way, but uh, you need a, a further modifier. You've almost got it, but you need a further modifier, okay? It's how does it increase it compared to the value that the target otherwise would have had? Does it increase, does it make it bigger than it would have been without increasing smoking? Or does it make it smaller than it would have been without increasing smoking? And as you said, all of those things being equal, all of other variables being equal. Maybe there's other things impacting it too when we're saying, hold up, hold all those things constant, okay? Um, yeah, in increase it relative to the baseline. Yes, that, that's good. Increase it to what it would have been otherwise. It's a counterfactual. We say, look, if we increase smoking, get a solemn impact of nicotine dependence, uh, what is that impact compared to if we hadn't changed smoking? I, I want to, again, distinguish this from saying, Increasing smoking makes nicotine dependence go up over time. It, it doesn't necessarily. Maybe it means increasing smoking means nicotine dependence is higher than it would have been, but it's still going down over time. That's fine. It, it's still a plus. It's still a plus associated with that because it increased it. It made it go down maybe more slowly than it would have otherwise. Um, maybe nicotine dependence is dropping due to other effects uh, that are that are in place. All of the things held equal, maybe it's going down. Increasing smoking might make it go down less quickly. Um, it'd still be a plus. We've increased it compared to the value it otherwise would have had, all of those things being equal. So that's what that plus means. Mm -hmm. um, it means if the source goes up, that source that that plus associated with the link from A to B means if A increases. B will tend to increase compared to the value it would have had if we hadn't changed A. And with all other pathways to it held, held equal. We don't have to worry about all the other things changing. How, how does this link uh, affect it? Okay. Um, there may be other links indirectly from smoking to uh, smoking to you know, they're the friends that they associate with or, or the links from from, from, um, from smoking to their exposure to advertising on 
you know, through internet channels and 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 so on, and and targets for coupon campaigns that affect nicotine dependence ultimately. But we're looking at this one link. Okay. Um, oh yeah, yeah. You're seeing black boxes because I have to look at the chat, and I'm and I don't have um, I don't have a uh, a second monitor here, unfortunately. So regret. Uh, that's the chat box. Yeah, I'll try to try to minimize it, but I I like to be able to look at your um, your responses too. Um, maybe what I'll do is overlap overlap these two and thoughts with this. Thank you for the feedback. That's helpful. Okay. So what would a minus mean if there were a minus? Let, let's say from um, from nicotine dependence to uh, or say from commitment to cessation to smoking. There's a minus there. You'll notice that link from commitment to cessation to smoking is negative. What is that? Why is it negative? Can anyone say? Okay, I'm here. So it would be lower when there is such factor compared to this video. Well, let's sharpen that. Uh, you're, you're getting, you're getting, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. You're getting, oh my gosh. Um, you're getting warm, but um, uh, but it's not quite that. It's, it would be lower when the source increases compared to the value it otherwise would have had um, if the source hadn't changed. Yeah, so it says the target value will, will decrease um, compared to what it would have had had the source not changed. Yes, but what it's specifically saying is if commitment to cessation, so to reason about this variable, that it's a minus, to reason, to, to figure out if it's minus, do you, do you think if the commitment to cessation goes up or the commitment to cessation goes down? Which, which do you tend to, the, the simple way to think about it is if commitment to cessation goes what? If it goes up, does smoking go up, tend to go up or down compared to the value it otherwise would have had, all those things being equal? And what this posits, what this, um, what this hypothesizes, as a dynamic hypothesis, as our best guess of the situation, is that as commitment to cessation goes up, the tendency, as, as one's more committed to cessation, the tendency to engage in smoking will tend to go down compared to the value it otherwise would have had had you not been more committed to cessation. Mm -hmm. And all other things considered being being equal. Now, here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen, it follows that if commitment to cessation goes down, where if we were to lower this, it follows in this sort of reasoning. And, and this gets into some really interesting mathematical questions involving assuming an analytic relationship between the two that you're not dealing with some discontinuous function or something, but um, generally we assume if, if commitment to cessation goes down, if, if you're less committed to cessation, smoking will be what, greater than what it otherwise would have been or less than what it otherwise would have been? Greater than. Sorry? Than otherwise it greater it than. Greater other. than, yeah. If you're less committed to cessation, it'll be tend to be You'll tend to smoke more if you're less committed to cessation. Okay, so so some people like to think of a minus as meaning opposite sign. So if you change A, how does it change B compared to what it would have been if you didn't change A? You know, does it change in the same direction or the opposite direction? So opposite, you increase commitment to cessation, smoking decreases. You decrease commitment to cessation, smoking will tend to increase um, compared to the compared to the value it otherwise would have had. It's not saying smoking is going up necessarily, it, it, but it's higher than it would have been if you hadn't lowered your commitment to cessation. Now, those of you who are, who are comfortable with um, more comfortable with mathematics, 
should know also this can be expressed with partial derivatives. What it's saying is the partial derivative of smoking with respect to commitment to cessation, which captures this notion of how does, how does smoking change as you change commitment to cessation, um, that that partial derivative is negative if this is a minus or positive if this if an arrow is a plus. So you could phrase it in terms of partial derivatives. Um, we, we consider how does the target change with respect to the source um, uh, in holding all other things equal. That's not something I expect everyone to have, but those who have a bit more math background, who have seen partial derivatives or who might be interested in learning about these neat beasts, um, uh, you should know that it, it can be unpacked in terms of partial derivatives. Um, so that's a little bit about uh, deriving the thinking for particular um, links here, the, the polarities. And my comment is that when it comes to our sort of broad, um, uh, the broad uh, sort of progression uh, of modeling, here we go, um, uh, you know, really we're in these first two stages um, we're, we're thinking about what's in our model, what's out, what do we consider as endogenous, exogenous, and ignored. Um, anyone anyone want to comment in the chat? What does endogenous thing mean? So if we say something is endogenous, we can it, think about that for a causal loop diagram. What would it mean? Yeah, it's generated internally. It's it's generated, it's it's produced. We we talk in AI these days, particularly in deep learning um context. Good, good. That's that's right, Karan. That's right, Mark. Um, we talk about generative models, and it's a very similar idea that um in deep learning you have sort of an emergent behavior from um a deep learning connectionist neural network um with multiple layers that's why it's you know it's a, it's a deep learning multiple hidden latent layers and it generates uh certain um uh, patterns uh, certain patterns here we have generative systems we 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 have emergent dynamics associated with certain variables we call endogenous mm -hmm. and then we have exogenous systems so what what is what are endogenous things are those what the system tells us? What are, or sorry, exogenous things. What are exogenous things? Who tells who for exogenous things? Yeah, the, what we tell to the system, what we say, assume this in some, it's not necessarily fixed over time. It's not necessarily constant over time, although it often is. It's just pre-specified. It could be changing in a pre-specified way over time. The model's not generating it. We're telling and then there are some things that are excluded, that are ignored. They're they're left out of the model. Those are the things decided problem conceptualization, and they make their way into the qualitative problem mapping space. Um, exogenous things will typically be variables that impact others, but are not directly um, driven by these loops in a causal loop diagram. Um, uh, end, endogenous things would be things that are driven by other variables. Um, and in ignored things or excluded things are simply not, not drawn. Um, so this occurs early on and, and, and has a key impact on our mental models. And it causal diagrams help us communicate, conceptualize, keep in mind certain relationships that can be really hard to keep just in our head. And, and they let us share them with others and, and get inputs from others, including many people with, with no modeling background, potentially you know, without a high school education to their name. Um, people from all walks of life um, can contribute quickly 
readily uh, to these diagrams. Um, and as such, they're, there's, they're, they're more effective tool for quickly eliciting you know, feedback, forgive the pun, from, from others and sort of capturing people's perspectives than trying to teach them the rules of stocks and flows or trying to teach them the rules of state charts, um, uh, teach them you know, what, how to interpret a hazard rate or what have you. Um, so, so this is a stage for, for bringing in understanding from many parties, and you can often do that very flexibly. Now, I want to highlight, though, that um, you know, these, these things are not solitudes for one another. You know, in system dynamics, this diagram-centric modeling tradition, we often start with causal loop diagrams early, and we sort of sketch out our understanding. Sometimes it includes a bunch of factors um, that we're not nearly ready to put into our simulation model, but we know are important. It's very easy to sort of sketch them out. Well, I shouldn't say easy. It's it's not very easy. No, it's it's very flexible in sketching them out. It's it's very you know the the medium the um, the mechanism of sketching them is not hard, right? Now, which variables we show, um, which ones we put down, what their relationship is to the others. Now, this is an art and a science, you know, really thinking that through, how to phrase them, what things to glom into one variable, what things to break out, how to characterize certain variables. Uh, these are things that, you know, take um, judiciousness, uh, care, um, thoughtfulness, um, and, and, um, and choosing the names so that they communicate, so that it's transparent, um, uh, laying it out, making it neither too small, too impoverished, too limited, nor too overwhelming in its size. I mean, these are all non-trivial things, I and mean, they, they take a lot of art. So I don't mean to say it's easy in that sense, but the the mechanisms, the sort of tools and the sort of elements of putting it down, those are um, uh, you know, the, the tools and the, um, the diagrammatic conventions and so on are really, really uh, uh, easy for people for all backgrounds uh, to, uh, uh, to get to which to contribute and and easy to relate to. If, forgive the lapse from the Queen's English, I am in the moment uh, outside the Commonwealth. Um, and, uh, and, and you know, we can easily sort of phrase these these diagrams in a, in a flexible fashion, potentially drag things around, rearrange things in ways that um, uh, are much easier than, than the mechanisms involved in updating and refactoring and changing a you know, a fully quantitative model. But I want to highlight that um, when you have causal loop diagrams, they have a relationship to, they're not solitudes from. The other diagrams that we will often end up building up, such as stock and flow diagrams or system structure diagrams, um, off where we go and elaborate. And this elaboration is not some willy-nilly process of just you know, reinventing things from scratch. You take the understanding here, in the causal loop diagram, and you you kind of successively explicate it. You successively elaborate it, but it's more than that. You sharpen it. You sharpen it. You you hone it. And uh, system and structure diagrams are are very much like. Um, uh, like these causal loop diagrams, but they include some additional components. And uh, uh, glancing at this diagram, some of those additional components should be obvious. What have we added when we've gone from this sort of picture um, to a picture like this? Can anyone spot a few, a few new things that are in their stocks and flows? Exactly. So we've captured as Fisa points out, and Akash uh, following her, her lead, is that we have we have 
captured accumulation processes and the, the, the changes in them over time. So it's not, not fully at this level of, of, um, of system structure diagrams. We haven't yet made it fully quantitative. These, uh, we, we've not yet specified all of that. We'll come to that in a minute. But we've specified what things are stocks and what things are flows for much of the diagram. Tell me, pray tell, why 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 might we want to capture like what 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 benefit? What benefit? I'm sorry, uh, jumping around here. What benefit would it have to go from a diagram that's purely based on causal loops like this? Uh, to to something that incorporates explicitly stocks and flows. Why might we like what what additional benefit to our reasoning might have having stocks and flows uh, add? What what might it kind of hint to us if we have stocks and flows? Okay, capture most important variables. That's that's true. Actually, we typically put our efforts into stocks and flows for the key elements of it, more quant quantitative analysis. So, so this is true, more quantitative analysis. Well, track and quantify relations, yeah. Ka capture rate of change. So what in a stock and flow diagram where you distinguish stocks and flows from other sorts of variables, what does this have to do with, with uh, a rates of change. What what here characterizes rates of change? Can anyone speak up? It is the flows. Exactly, Mark. Exactly, Patrick. Awesome. It's, it's the flows that capture the rates of change in the stocks. But stocks capture something too. They capture the state, don't they? They capture the current situation. They capture what is the case right now? If you froze time, what? And, and you were to, to sort of be able to go and count things. That, those would be the stocks. You could count how many um, women are currently being productive outside of poverty or how many women are, are productive but remain in poverty or, or women not being productive in poverty. Um, because they're living him to mouth. You could go and count the number of people in a hospital ward. You could go and count the amount of money in your bank account right now, or the uh, the amount of, of water in a bathtub right now. These are things you can quantify. If you froze time, it's like, I can go and count these things. Flows aren't like that. Why aren't flows like that? Can anyone say? Why are flows not? merely things you can instantaneously count. If you froze time, you can count it. Why aren't flows like that? Flows are continuous. Yeah, they're, they're continuous. It's, and only, yes, it's only meaningful when it goes together with time. We need to consider it over time. If, if, if I were to tell you, you know, um, there were, um, you're at Mass General. Um, there, are, if I said, you know, uh, Mass General had a hundred births. There were there were a hundred births in Mass General. For that to be meaningful, to have a sense like, is that a lot or a little? What would you need to ask about? If I said there are a hundred births in in Mass General, what would you need to ask about? Over how long? Exactly, Eric. Over how long? The time unit. Do you mean like 100 births in the last hour? 100 births in the last year? 100 births in the past day? Like what? Over what time, right? It's a flux. It's a, it's a change over time. Is it fast or is it slow? Well, we have to consider, it's almost like when we give a flow, we we specify how much would accumulate, like how many babies would accumulate over the course of some period of time, right? We have to consider a time period. Okay, if you waited a week, there'd be 100 babies. Or if you waited a night, there'd be 100 babies. Um, or if you waited an hour, there'd be 100 babies. 
right? Um, when we're dealing with flows, it's ready to flow. If you perhaps look out your window and see powerfully flowing beneath your vision the, the, the mighty South Saskatchewan River there, were I only there. Um, and you were to say, you know, what what is it, uh, um, you know, how 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 much water does it move, right? You have to you have to quantify it in terms of time, right? It's it's uh, a million cubic meters per month or per per week. It's a flow, right? If you say how much water is coming into your bathtub. and I will use the naturally superior metric system um, uh, despite my current surrounds. Um, and, and I were to say, you know, four liters, you'd need to ask four liters per second, per minute, per hour, right? Um, uh, you, you couldn't just say four liters. Uh, uh, you know, how much, how quickly is water coming into the bathtub? It's coming in Four liters. No, you have to say per liter, per second, per year, per 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 minute, or whatever. Um, makes sense. So when we're dealing with, in you know, putting in stocks and flows into a causal diagram, even though we haven't specified everything about it, we haven't specified the formulas associated or formulae uh, associated with these uh, flows. We've sharpened it. We know what's an accumulation versus we know what's a rate of change. We know where the state is, what things are elements of state. And we often get a sense of where the inertia in the system is, what things take time to change. And a stock can flow, if we, if we distinguish stocks and flows, well, um, which things might have inertia there? Which things in this diagram might have inertia? You tell me. The what? Is it these variables? Is it the flows? What things might have inertia in a, in a diagram like this? If, if we're really careful about mapping out what's a stock, what's a flow, what things carry inertia? What things carry kind of the momentum of the system or the, the you know, um, uh, turns out that the inertia is carried by the, think about your bathtub. It's gonna require time to drain if there's a lot of water, it's the stocks. That, that's the where the inertia is. If there's, if you're like the Boston Aquarium, um, not two kilometers from here, um, there's a lot of water in that there bathtub, so to speak. Um, it's gonna take a long time to drain. There's a lot of inertia associated with it. Um, if, if you have a, a bathtub, like a, a typical one in an apartment, um, it's going to take a shorter time to drain. If you have a sink, it's going to have less time to drain yet. It's the stocks, ladies and gentlemen, the accumulation. That's where inertia is kept. It takes time to build it up and it takes time to drain it. If you have a bank account, you have a bit of leeway. If there's an interruption, perhaps if you have a big bank account, it's a bit of leeway for you to between two jobs. Um, uh, and you know, if you have a, a capacious apartment and you open the the door to the outside for a moment, maybe it's a sliding door to the cold air outside, you can sustain that for a brief time because you know it it there's a lot of heat capacity, the notion of stock, you know, in that apartment. There's, it's an accumulation, it's a stock, it's, a, it's an element of state, it takes time to change it. Whereas if you, if you, you know, have an apartment that's much, much, much smaller, and you leave the door to the outside open, it will lose its heat more quickly, right? Um, uh, so anyway, these are, these are concepts. So when we introduce stocks and flows, even when we don't put in the formulas, the formulae, we've sharpened things. We've sort of encoded some added understanding. We've elaborated it. We've explicated to go from cause loop diagrams to system structure diagrams, and then going from system structure, system structure diagrams to stock and flow diagrams. That, ladies and gentlemen, that marks a big transition. 
it marks the transition from from qualitative problem mapping to model formulation, where we've really specified the model at a sufficient level to allow it to be simulated. Again, precise, not necessarily accurate, but at least precise, unambiguous enough that we can simulate it. And for that, we have to specify parameter values. And critically, for a stock of flow diagram, we have to specify flow formulas, formulas for the flows. You know, the the, the formulas to use as well for the um, for the so-called dynamic variables or auxiliary variables, um, is a more common name for them, uh, such as uh, such as these. But for a causal diagram or system structure diagram, we can be fairly flexible at characterizing these things, and we'll often reason about these causal diagrams here. Um, you know, sorry, reason about the polarity associated with loops. So you tell me, maybe we'll go back to this to, for simplicity. How can I go from a, um, from a simple uh, uh, loop like this um, after I've determined the polarity for each link um, from A to B and B to C and C to A, um, where A, B, and C are smoking, health, and commitment to cessation, respectively, how how could I if I, if I have thought through using this reasoning if A increases does B increase or decrease compared to the value it otherwise would have had all other things being equal if I go through that reasoning um and I do that for each of the lengths and along a pathway maybe it's a circular pathway maybe it's it's not a circular pathway uh, um. Maybe it's a just a sort of a, a, a pathway, you know, from one variable to another. And, you know, and you have this pathway through fatigue, efficiency, work accomplished per day, and this pathway through more time working. If I have a pathway like that, I've already figured out the polarity associated with each of these links. How do I know the polarity from the start variable uh, to this end variable here? How do I how do I determine that? Anyone? Do a product of all the, mm. so true other link, do a product of signs. Product of signs is the operative word. I see add and I see product there. Which of those is correct? Is it product or is it addition? Product, the eyes have it. That is correct. It's the product. It's the rule of signs. Plus times a plus gives a what? Plus. Plus times a minus gives a what? Minus. That's right. Minus times a plus gives a what? Same thing. Right? Good. And a minus times a minus. This is the, yes, plus. Yes, exactly. Exactly. If it were a sum, you add a plus and a minus, what do you get is zero or, or, or something? Get the unit value? No, 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 we don't want that. We don't want that. Um, no, that, that's not going to be useful. And, and look, this is not some, you know, inchoate rule, some, you know, um, mysterious rule that just you got to memorize. I mean, it, if I may, it makes sense. I mean, look, um, if you have, uh, let's suppose these these two links here, let's say, so say from fatigue to efficiency and efficiency to work accomplished per day. This is a minus, this first one. This minus is associated with this guy. Uh, and, and this is a plus. So, so look, to reason about the polarity for the whole length, to reason about polarity for lengths, you, it's really, really helpful to just very consistently ask if the source of that particular link goes up, does the target go up or down compared to the value it otherwise would have had being being equal, and use that to determine the link. So you always go through that that increase. Human human brain is very poor at a lot of things, and one of them is reasoning about double negatives. So you want to you want to be careful throwing around negatives casually. It's it's good in general to kind of try to 
trying to sharpen your thinking by 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 thinking about the it in a more reliable, easy way, which is thinking about it, the source increasing. Yeah. Um, so um yeah, so that double that double uh parallel line that indicates a delay. Thank you, Wade. Yeah. So um we'll come back to that in a second. But let's let's talk about these two links. So what this minus link is, it's saying if fatigue goes up, efficiency will do what compared to the value it otherwise would have had other than the things being equal. What is this minus indicating? Fatigue goes up, then efficiency will go up or down. Yes, compared to the value it otherwise would have had all other things being equal. You notice that all other things being equal is relevant here because it means basically we can put aside this pathway, right? Um, we don't have to worry that this is changing at the same time. No, no, no. We just say, if this goes up, does this go down or up compared to the value it otherwise would have had all other things being equal, I mean, we don't have to, you know, that this pathway doesn't change. Yeah. Um, and then, and this positive, uh, if efficiency goes up, does work accomplished per day go up or down compared to the value it otherwise would have had for efficiency to work accomplished up? Yeah, good, good. So that's good. Now let's think through, and I, I want you to pay attention I've established the polarity for links, individual links. Okay. Um, now I'm, I'm going to reason about the, the polarity associated with the pathway from fatigue to work accomplished per day as a whole. And watch how my reasoning goes step by step, but in a different way. Pay note to this because it could come up to a quiz near you or to a final exam near yet in the fullness of time. Yeah, so so Mark is as normal ahead of the game. So if fatigue goes up, efficiency will go down. Now watch this next step. As efficiency goes down, because this is a plus link, will work accomplished per day go down or up? If efficiency goes down, work accomplished will go down. Right, exactly. If efficiency were to go up, work accomplished per day would go what? Up. I mean, yeah. So, so, so the basic idea is you trace through, and you successively reason about you know the net change as as one goes on, bearing in mind how you've gotten here, what the net change has been so far. So, as fatigue goes up, efficiency goes down, and as efficiency goes down. You know, compared to the value it otherwise would have had, all those things being equal, and efficiency goes down. Compared to the value it otherwise would have had, all those things being equal, then work accomplished per day will go down compared to the value it otherwise would have had. All those things being equal. Mm -hmm. um, so what it's saying is, as fatigue goes up, work accomplished through this pathway, work accomplished per day will go down compared to the value it otherwise would have had, all those things being equal through this pathway. Now, that's not the only pathway in this entire diagram. Um, and, you know, we could reason about uh, other pathways, but it is the only one shown between fatigue and work accomplished per day. The net effect of it is the rule of signs, minus times plus, right? This first minus lowers this, you know, and then the second one goes in the same direction. If this had been a minus, the net effect would have been positive. This uh, fatigue going up, if, if this final link here from efficiency to work accomplished per day, but minus as fatigue goes up, efficiency would have gone down, tip of the value, otherwise would have had all those things being equal. I'm going to stop saying that. And as efficiency goes up, as it goes down, then work accomplished per day would have gone up if, if this had been a minus. And so it, the, the rule of signs comes from a commonsensical not notion if you really think through mechanistically what's going on at each stage, the net change of, you know, the, 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 the link, the current link, you could think of it as changing the opposite or same direction. It may be a useful heuristic here um, uh, compared to the net change thus far, right? Um, and the rule of signs falls out of it. It's, it's nothing just to memorize and, and regurgitate. It's it's kind of common sense applied to this diagram. Now let's talk about this little hash mark, this little 
double cross. Yeah, so this indicates a delay. So what it's saying is, look, kind of compared to the time scale on how quickly, let's say, fatigue affects efficiency. Uh, my sister uh, just a few days ago spent all night in my dad's hospital room, and um, I can tell you she was totally beat the next day, um, so much so, you know, we, we need to uh, uh, be careful to to have the caregiver sustainability and and that fatigue you know within less than a day it affected her efficiency hugely um but over time you know undergoing overtime working extra hours beyond um uh, your 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 normal limits will build up fatigue but it will tend to build it up um you know uh in a in a way that uh, has some delays associated with it. Uh, you might be able to to work overtime for a few days, you know, a few hours extra before fatigue sets in. Um, and so, you know, you could quibble with this particular case, and and I admit, you know, it bears discussion. But sometimes there are links in our diagrams that are slower effects, and sometimes there are links that are longer term, or slower term effects, you know, shorter term effects, I should say, longer term effects. And uh, the ability to form these hash marks um, um, allows us to distinguish shorter term from longer term effects. Mm. Um, yeah, so... Uh, we talked about the links associated with, so closure on that, links associated with pathways, and often those pathways happen to be circular, right? We happen to have a pathway here from smoking that that leads to um, leads to this uh, impact uh, on itself um, at a at a later time. Um, can anyone, pathways have stories associated with it. Um, they have a kind of common sense gold notation. These, oh, sorry, the, the causal loops, the, these loops have, have stories. These feedbacks have stories. What's kind of the story associated with this loop? Can anyone say? What's, what's the story associated? Ah, let's get it out of the way. What's the story associated with this loop? What's the story associated with this loop? What what kind of can anyone describe at an intuitive level? What does this loop say? I, I would give it a try. Good. And who is this? Dosif. Uh thoughts a uh, Dosif. Thank you so much for, for giving okay. it a try. Yeah, please. So uh, let me start from smoking. So mm -hmm. a person smokes. Mm -hmm. So given that every other variable is the same, mm -hmm. after a certain amount of delay, health starts to decrease than it otherwise would have been. As health starts to decrease, the commitment to satiation also decreases given otherwise it would have been. Mm -hmm. Even when that decreases, Think, think carefully about that. As health decreases, there's a minus sign. What does that mean? Commitment to cessation will do. As health goes down, commitment to cessation will go. Sorry, increase. Ah, ah. So it's double negative, right? Awesome. And then so it increases. Mm -hmm. If this increases, mm -hmm. then the amount of smoking would decrease, even mm -hmm. if, it, given if it otherwise would have been the value. That's right. So, so that that's exactly right. And Rachel had a, a also so very good, very good, excellent, Dawseth. I and I so admire your leadership and and speaking up about that. Um, uh, several others have chimed in, and and Rachel uh, first among them. Um, uh, if you smoke more, your health will go down, which will make you more likely to try to give up on on smoking. Right? There's a kind of pushback effect. Right? Um, if I smoke. It'll it'll make it'll you know cause problems with my health that might maybe not definitively, but it will tend to make me to kind of push back against my tendency to smoke. It'll tend to over time 
get me to question smoking and, and maybe make me more inclined to quit because I have a hacker's, you know, a smoker's cough, or a hacking cough, or I have start to develop asthma or start to develop emphysema, or I start to develop, um, you know, a, a COPD, a chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, or I start to develop heart disease, or I start to develop lung cancer, you know, um, uh, it, it worsens my diabetes. I mean, all of these things are unfortunately health effects. Now, what's really important here is um, uh, that you have this double link, and that indicates a what? A delay, exactly. So, so it is true, probably, that smoking will impact your health, but it's not instantaneous. And often it's during the teenage years in North America that a lot of kids start smoking, fall prey to the, frankly, predatory processes or you know, practices of, of, of tobacco companies. And it's not really like putty in their hands often. It's, it's terrible with, with, with all sorts of strategies. Um, uh, they study the psychology of kids and they study the psychology of individuals to be manipulated and, you know, really, really uh, put out the efforts. And, um, and yet the effects on health are not for many, many years, often decades, right? And so tragically, often um, uh, this, this will lead to this regulatory diagram. I say regulatory because as smoking goes up, it, it eventually pushes in the reverse direction, damps out it, or it doesn't necessarily damp out, it pushes back against that initial pull. Um, now, as, as smoking goes less and someone is full of life and they, they have really good health, they, they might think, well, look, you know, I'm invincible. I mean, a lot of teenagers think, right? And some in the young 20s, mind you, mind you, um, think, you know, I'm invincible. Uh, you know, I'm the finest, you know, I, 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 uh, I have just awesome health. Maybe you're athletic. Maybe you um, have never had any problems with, uh, with, with, you know, minor infections. You think your immune system is really, uh, really good stuff. And yeah, well, you could, you could, you know, uh, handle a cigarette or two. And you can smoke casually at a, at a, at a, at a party or, or uh, with friends and, you know, uh, eventually you may find yourself, you know, starting to use them as, as support mechanisms for dealing with stress. And then you fall into the habit. So it is true that, uh, you know, uh, if, if, if you're engaged in uh, little smoking, your health might go up, which might lead you to question the need for cessation, the need to be careful about cigarettes more generally and smoking. Now, this this actually, you know, hides some things though that you could bring out in a, in a stock flow diagram or a system structure diagram. One of these that has stocks and flows, but alongside, you know, these um, alongside these uh, uh, causal loop elements, um, uh, which is. Uh, you know, this really talks about cessation here um, and commitment to cessation. But really what we're dealing with often, once we think about stock flow, we think about different categories of smokers. Like, okay, they're, they're, they're people who are never smokers or have never yet smoked. There are some who are current smokers. And then there's some that are former smokers. Um, may, maybe you even want to distinguish between like short-term former smokers versus long-term former smokers. Someone who's been quit for over a year, for you know, five years, therefore very unlikely to fall back in. And you start to think about, okay, well, look, the processes that drive smokers, yeah, they include cessation. That, 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 that increases, you know, if, if people see smoking if they quit it decreases smoking yeah that's true but there's another process once you start thinking about the stocks and flows and start breaking out you know never smokers and current smokers and former smokers you realize there's a lot more to driving smoking 
current number of current smokers than just cessation, than just quitting. What else would there be that would be driving the number of smokers beyond quitting? Can anyone say? Um, external interventions. Well, okay, external interventions, that's true, but let's 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 just talk about basic processes that might influence how many people, you know, things that represent contribute to the rates of change of the number of smokers. What else besides um yeah, new people starting to smoke, initiation of smoking, right? And really that's kind of submerged or eclipsed or kind of hidden within this diagram because we're assuming that, you know, uh, if smoking is low, it means, you know, someone's health is high and therefore they, you know, because their health is high, they tend to have a lower commitment to cessation. But maybe the operative thing for a lot of kids with really good health is, you know, how likely are they are to start smoking? So it's true, cessation influences this, but so does, you know, likely of initiation and often health, you know, young strapping youths like yourselves, you know, th they have really good health and they, um, they have a um, less, uh, they have a, if they have really good health, maybe they, they're less cautious about initiating smoking, trying a few cigarettes, sharing them with friends. So, so beyond cessation, if we start to think about stocks and flows, we start to unpack things. We start to kind of divide it into pieces. You know, we have cessation going on. We have initiation going on. And there's one other thing that, that affects the number of smokers. What, what might that be? The number of people who are doing what? Uh, well, yeah, uh, smokers dying is good. I like that. But actually, I was thinking relapse. So people who have quit smoking or, or quit, they might be more likely to to fall back um, into smoking if their health you know, recovers. Uh, or, But there's other reasons. There's other bigger drivers, typically, right? Um, there's, there's drivers associated with... Uh, uh, with craving for nicotine, et cetera. I really like the the point about smokers dying. That's a that's actually a really big one that tragically affects those um, typically older individuals, you know, who who are were smokers. Um, there's much higher mortality, and it's related to this delayed effect on health. Right, by the time someone sees just how it's affected their body, how ubiquitously. How it's affected their lungs, how it's affected their their heart health, their cardiovascular health, the brittleness of their their arteries, um, how it's affected their their likely of getting diabetes, how it's affected their you know their uh, ability to keep out other infections. By that time, they're older, and the risks of mortality start to really play a role. So. Anyway, causal loop diagrams are these really powerful ways of talking about these issues, but we often will elaborate them. And by elaborating them, we capture additional distinctions. This notion of you know, state, what are rates of change of state versus current situation, we also capture these issues like um, you know, thinking more in finer grained level about what factors drive a given stock, say the stock of people who are smoking, the amount of smoking, the number of people who are smoking in the population, we start to break that down into additional kind of processes that drive it. Um, so um, causal diagrams are, are, are very powerful for, for thinking through these, um, uh, these different uh, steps. And and you know, as such, they often will then take us to start thinking about, you know, what needs to be in our uh, in our model. What things are most important? What things might be be uh, important drivers in our model? Uh, but they also get us to think, and and I think you folks saw in this in this. Uh, a set of lecture slides, which I need to post for you. So I'm, I'm, I'm behind. I just reminded. I, I, 
I will post some slides right after this talk. I'll, I'll promise that. We'll post these slides. Um, but um, I want to think for a moment. What one benefit when we start incorporating these causal loop diagrams is you could start to reason about behavior. You know, but by breaking out these loops, uh, I would argue that we're actually starting to deal with sort of patterns of behavior. It's not always hard and fast rules, but generally these sort of loops in a causal loop diagram have sort of archetypical or, or, or prototypical or kind of emblematic or sort of representative of generally speaking, we have certain types of behaviors associated with these. And I wanna talk about that. I have some slides on this that I could show, but I wanna ask you because you've been watching the videos. Evidently many of you are, and I have, everyone has been. So what types of feedbacks are there? Can anyone say? List out two major types of feedbacks. Anyone? Positive and negative. Good. Um, excellent. And sometimes we'll distinguish negative feedbacks, which also have a long delay. And I love how um, how uh, Patrick also said, and, and others too, reinforcing and balancing. That's getting at what I'm going to be, about what I'm going to be speaking now. So when we have a... <laughs> When we have a, a, a negative feedback, a, a feedback labeled negative based on the you know, product of science is the kind of heuristic, but common sense about how it changes um, as you follow it through. Um, same versus opposite, you know, interpretation of, of links. If we have this negative, what is that, what is that telling us about behavior over time typically? And balances. Well, yeah, so so I like that. Self decaying. Yeah, self limiting. I would say you know, marking as normal is, is is getting at the some of the heart of the issues. But I, I it's it's a better term would be self limiting. What do I mean by self limiting? Or self decaying is not bad either. Actually, I have to say, hats off to Mark. Um, That's all. Um, uh, why do why why is it self limiting or self decaying? Yeah. Um, so what it's telling us? Yeah, it's it's stabilization. Rachel's got it too. Um, so it kind of oscillate. It can oscillate, particularly if there's a big um, delay. But it, what it's saying is, look, a, a negative feedback is saying a, a change in something. Maybe it's hunger leads to a cascading set of changes, which lead me, you know, because I'm hungry, to go and seek out food. And because of that, I I tend to decrease the original change, you know, my increase in my hunger. Or if, if I increase smoking, it'll cause over time a, change, a lowering of my health, which will increase my commitment to cessation, which will lower the occurrence of my smoking. So... So, so if we posit an increase in one factor, it leads to a set of changes that ripple around this loop and push back against that original change. It thanks the original change. It doesn't necessarily totally reverse it. It doesn't eliminate it, but it, it pushes in the opposite direction. You know, it's kind of like one of these things, right? Here's a, here's a, here's a bam, right? Um, as I pull it, it pulls back on itself, right? Um, and it can lead to oscillation, um, but it can also lead to, you know, just makes it harder and harder to pull. So it limits my ability to, you know, pull it, right? It 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 regulates itself. It's self-regulating. It limits how far it can change. It it moves towards some sort of stability where it's balanced in terms of the forces outwards and inwards, right? It gravitates, it converges towards 
a balanced state. It has balance. It's hence the term balancing loop. We call it a regulatory loop. And it's in general, our bodies are just filled with these loops. And I, I, I mentioned it, right? These, these physiological, psychological, psychosocial processes that govern us are just filled with these sort of regulatory loops. That's how our bodies survive. That's how you stay warm in the winter. That's how you stay hydrated in the summer, in the winter for that matter. It's how you know to get food. It's how you have craving for certain vitamins or salts or what have you. Homeostasis is the word of the day. Exactly, Mark. Exactly. Homeostasis. How our bodies stay, you know, in balance. That's how our building systems stay in balance, right? With thermostats. It's too cold, they warm up. It's too hot, they lay off the heating, right? Here in Boston, as well as in sunny Saskatoon. The, you know, much of modern society is built out on regulatory processes, and hopefully your education as well. But these are not the only sorts of loops. These loops are associated with, uh, the regulatory loops are associated with behaviors. Mm. Um, and why am I not uh, getting, ah, mumble, okay. Um, uh, why am I not getting uh, that uh, that diagram? Here we go. You you get behavior. Okay, there's an initial change, um, departure from some equilibrium, and then it kind of damps itself out. It limits itself. It brings itself back into some sort of balance. It's stable. It exhibits stability. Nope, my words. Uh, it exhibits stability. You, you can nudge it, but it tends to self-correct, right? Um, by contrast, what's the behavior, pray tell, associated with uh, a positive loop like this? Anyone? Is that homeostatic? No, it leads to exponential growth. It leads to change that builds on itself, that snowballs, that grows larger and larger and larger. As, as one smokes more, one develops more a stronger addiction to nicotine, which boosts smoking yet further. That's the story here, right? The growth builds on itself. A change initially in smoking, to have someone smoke more, leads to a ripple through a set of effects around the loop. Here are just two factors, but you know, could in general be 10, that amplify that the direction of that original change. This other loop, the, the the regulatory loop, you know, a change will 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 lead to a ripple through effect that will push back against that original change. But here it amplifies it, furthers it. It's in the same direction as the original change, so it grows larger and larger and larger, right? Um, uh, so so maybe you're engaged in social marketing of a, of a product or a service. Um, for for societal good and 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 you know you, uh, you you increase its visibility by by at buying spots ads you know maybe it's on um, Google ads or maybe you buy it on 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 Apple platform uh, you buy it on Facebook or whatever and this message uh, gets shared more and people maybe will sometimes point others to it and say, oh, cool, did you know about this, this service? Um, uh, and, and share it with others and it grows. That's, that's what companies often hope for, right? Gangbuster growth. This is the story of Google. It's the story of Microsoft. It's the story of, of Twitter until it got taken over by a twit. Um, it's the story of uh, you know countless tech companies that have sought to grow um, uh, you know, successively, uh, and uh, started to, you know, compound the earlier growth. And often this leads to growth in the next little bit that's proportional to all the growth before it. So uh, here we have, you know, growth uh, 
leading to growth, leading to growth, leading to growth, promoting more and more faster and faster growth. It snowballs. That's the archetypical dynamic. But I did mention there's some special dynamics that comes in when you have a when you have a uh, delay, a long delay. And what is that dynamic? What's what's special when we have a long delay? What does it tend to lead to? Oscillation. Yeah, it leads to oscillation. So that's exactly right. Fisa and Rachel and Tyler. It's exactly right. And dot. Yes, leads to oscillation. It leads to situations where a variable, you know, it, a change in variable A, maybe it's in smoking, will lead to a change in health, but only over time. And sometimes what it leads to is, and I'm, I'm not going to follow it all through here, is situations, because I don't think it's highly representative here, but it will lead to situations where, you know, it ripples around to, to damp itself out, but by the time it pushes back against itself, it it kind of overextends it, pushes to lower the variable um, below uh, the value it's it's obtained. And so it's gone in the opposite direction and it compensates. And so it's like steering on ice for a car, if anyone has, has had that unpleasant experience where, you know, you, you overcompensate and it it swerves around and you have to swerve it back and back and it, it kind of oscillates. You overshoot your target because you're not seeing the effects desired. So you're maintaining your pressure on the system too long. It isn't that it has no effect. It's just it'll take some time to have effect and you, you push it too far. And that ends up leading you to overshoot. And then you have a change in the opposite direction to bring you back uh, into, into balance, but that too is delayed. And so you kind of swerve around, but typically you get closer, um, closer to some sort of, uh, um, to some sort of uh, uh, equilibrium. It just, it, it oscillates around it. So it pulls back and you overshoot, and you overshoot in it and eventually reaches it in some damped way. So that's with a delay uh, impact. Um, and uh, we do see these things um, in all sorts of circumstances, including infectious diseases, including communicable diseases like COVID-19. And I will just note, let's not have those delays affect our class. Let's, let's get vaccinated sooner to protect ourselves from the coming COVID season. Our hospitals can't take it. Hospital systems. Here in the U.S., it's the same, same shtick. My father waited many days to get admitted to a tertiary a tertiary hospital, a teaching hospital, um, from a regional hospital, uh, because they were full. And they're full um, in large part because of COVID-19 uh, and RSV and flu coming together. We knew about this modelers amongst us, you know, three years back. Um, but it's not just that they, more people needing care, it's that it's also infecting the care staff, which means fewer people to serve the patients, which means fewer beds can be open, which means they fill up sooner. And let's not contribute to that. Let's not worsen that story. Let's not have big oscillations affect us and only lead you to get premature, you know, um, delayed vaccination. Try to get it sooner. Do your part. Okay. Um, so uh, that's all we have time for today. Uh, I apologize very much for not being with you in person. I would so like to to uh, to do so, but I'm going to wrap up now, and um, uh, I will look forward to uh, seeing you in person on Thursday. Uh, I will be posting assignment one. Um, hopefully tonight, if not uh, early tomorrow. And uh, I appreciate your accommodation. And on Thursday, those pursuing projects should plan to, to, to we'll, we'll have some time in the last 10 or 15 minutes of class just to, to talk about projects, okay? Thank you so much. It's great to see you remotely. Thanks for your contributions and for your accommodations.